way to start a service with that just not all right that's awesome if you are able please stand with us and we'll begin praise and singing hope.
welcome, welcome. It's good morning and great. What a great morning it is to be here. It's beautiful outside. It's even more beautiful inside. What a wonderful time the Lord has given us to be in His house. I'm excited to be here to praise and worship our God. And we're going to get right to it. Would you just lay it out for us this morning? I pray that everything we need to hear this morning, that we hear this morning. Now, if you want to say, let's see, we're going to pray for the offering now. So if you guys would go ahead and come forward. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. You give to us in so many ways and so many times. And Lord, we are so thankful for what you do. And so I thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to give you thanks. And so I pray that we would take a moment to say these things to you. And we give you thanks for what you've done for us. Give us and use us for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to praise his name today. We're going to start this song with the chorus. Can you take your finger and just lead us in prayer? my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree body bound and great in tears they laid him Messiah still, my 
That again, this time, voices only, voices only. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Always be how great. How great is our God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So, in the book of Acts, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. In other words, it's in Christ alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, the solid ground. Up through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, the striving sees. My comforter, my
return or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand here in the power of Christ I'll stand Amen Let's pray this morning Father God we come to you this morning Lord, in Christ alone Our solid ground, always firm. Lord, I thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. And I thank you for Jesus. Well, let me just say it again. I thank you for Jesus. Lord, that we have that hope. Lord, I pray as, as we now move into your word that we continue our worship in your word. May you speak to us fresh and new today, Lord. Maybe words that we've heard before, but each time we look at it, Lord, you can put something new into our hearts, Lord. And I pray that we hear with our hearts today and not just our ears. Lord, I pray for our pastor as he preaches this morning, giving give the boldness and the strength to preach your words, Lord, that you have anointed him with. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, where you at, Miss Judy? You're supposed to stand up and wave your arms. I remembered, and you didn't, all right? So a uh, couple of reminders. Um, first of all, great job, Kenny, and, and uh, band, and choir. Uh, I understand that you guys are practicing on Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock, and there's room for you, all kind of room. So, uh, so if you'd like to be a part of uh, what they're doing, I, I encourage you to come to practice on Wednesday nights. But um, So let me tell you what's happening this week on Thursday night. We are going to Foothills, and uh, we will be doing a party there. Um, last time we went, man, I had a blast, had a great time, but I encourage and invite you all to come see Miss Judy uh, if you want to sign up to bring something or just come be a part. And it's a special time that we get to love on some real, real sweet people. And um, like I said, last time was I just enjoyed it. Every time we have the opportunity to go out, I have a great time with that. And also on, um, let's see, on Saturday, is it 3 o'clock? Is that, well, I, I believe the funeral is, the memorial service is at 3, but then, is it 2? And then after that, um, it's, it's at 2, yeah, 2, 2 o'clock is the memorial service, and then following the memorial service, um, there will be a, a time that the church will feed the Crawford family. Um, so, uh, again, see Miss Judy, I guess, if you uh, want to be a part. Uh, no, you're pointing to somebody else. There's a sign-up sheet. So there's a sign-up sheet to get that taken care of. Um, <clears throat> You know what never gets old? Is seeing those waters stirred. You know, I almost put my clothes back in a bag and thought, well, I'll put them up till next time. Then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to leave them out just in case. You never know. We might have a baptism at the end of the service. You just never know. And I'll be ready this time. I got clothes. And uh, so Becky and I, we, we kind of put our heads together and we thought about some, some things that we could do to have some some uh, t-shirts on hand, some ready, uh, some t-shirts, some shorts, some towels, and all of that. So uh, we, we are in the process of that. But if the Lord lays it on your heart that, that uh, first of all, if you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is your day of salvation. Um, and then if you've never followed in the Lord and believer's baptism, uh, and you would like to do that, uh, the water is warm. Right, Derek? It's warm. So he said it sure is. Um, I do have this problem. Becky, do you see right there in the seat beside you? that wad of paper. You, you see that? Um, so, I'll, and now you, you're scared to touch it. I left my clothes hanging in the bathroom, right? In the stall. And, and I told Derek, I said, I'm in that last stall. And I was real hesitant. As a matter of fact, I thought it through a little bit and thought, I'm going to take my wallet out. I'm going to take my phone out because I know who was in this building, all right? So I had all those things taken care of, but when I came to sit down, I had toilet paper stuffed in my pockets when I got in here. Now, I'm not saying who that is, but let me tell you what he did on Thursday. So Leon has been upset with me. I, I need to tell you all that. I, I mean, my days here are numbered because Leon's been upset with me. And the reason he's upset with me is because he had told Miss Brenda that I was treating him like he was old. We'll do that again. And, and, and one of the ways I was treating him like he was old, I called in reinforcements to put up a fence this week. And so I should have known it was going to turn out the way it did. 
But as we're putting up the fence, you know, if you've ever put up a chain link fence before, when you pound the poles in, you don't like try to bend the poles when you're putting them in the ground. You just tap them in and, and they'll eventually go in. Oh no, just because it takes me three taps, somebody's got to do it in one. And they bend all the poles and you have to do something else along with that. We got to the very last pole right beside the building, right? So Coach Knight, not that I'm saying any names, reaches up to slam the pole in one more time and the thing comes off the sleeves and hits him right on top of the head. This is a metal iron contraption, right? He has his baseball cap on, hits him on the head, right on the pin part of that ball, splits his head open, blood coming down his head, and Leon's like, so Leon, I apologize for treating you like you're old, all right? You can outwork, you outwork me like nobody's business, and more than likely anybody else in this church. And how you do that 80 plus years old, I don't know. I just hope I can move at 60. Um, but to do what you do is absolutely amazing. But um, the Lightsies were here yesterday cutting up trees. Man, I appreciate you guys so much for doing that and uh, working. And, and uh, there was one time, I almost started to take a picture, but there, was, there were four little girls around me raking mulch yesterday. And I thought, oh, that is so, so cool. That is really cool. Hey, we're going to be in the book of Acts. And uh, I'm excited about this. We have lots of guests today. As I look around the room, I see some first-time visitors. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Uh, we have a special treat for you back in the back. So if you haven't uh, gotten a form to fill out the information about your name and address and all of that, um, a phone number that we can get in touch with you, if you would just turn that in or just go by the visitor's desk at the end of the service, we have a special mug with our church logo on it. We would love to gift to you for, for being here today. You know, um, some people in the world have really bought into uh, the lie that the church is irrelevant today. That there is, um, that the church has no importance in society. That there, there's a movement out there that suggests that, that lives that, that acts that way, it, it, usually until crisis happens. Can I tell you that crisis is going to happen in life? I wish we could avoid it. And one day when we are all in heaven, we will avoid crisis. But until, until then, until that day comes, well, there will be crisis in life. But there are people in the world that have bought into this. And I wrote this word down that that is absolutely ludicrous. I like that word. I think there's a commercial on TV with ludicrous in it, right? I want us to understand that the church is the most important body in the world. You in this room, us in this room, we make up the body of Christ. If it weren't for you, we would not be as strong as we could be. We need every single one of you, every visitor that's in this room, every founding member that's in this room, Every single person that's walked through these doors, and if you're watching online, we need you. We want you to be a part of this body of Christ. Now, what does that mean? That means that some of us are the brains. Some of us are the big toe, right? But we need a big toe because if you don't have a big toe, you're off balance. So we need each one of you. But we need to understand that the, the, the body, uh, the church, is the most important body in the world today. Far in a way beyond every other body because whatever happens in the world happens as a result of something that is or is not happening in the church. If you look at that, you look at everything that's going on in the world, it's all connected to the church. The church is the is God's plan to move the gospel forward. There's a purpose behind that. A story is told, and I know where some of your minds are going to go, but a story is told of there was a man who lived with his wife and, and they had an old family farm for years, barely getting by. All the while, beneath the barren, dusty, almost unfarmable land was a rich supply of oil. And while digging a water well, the farmer discovered it. Thus, he and his wife enjoyed a life of rich blessings. That was like the Beverly Hillbillies, right? The farmer said, and to think we lived here all these years without knowing how rich we, re we really were. To live here all these years and not realize how rich we really are. But you know, unfortunately, many Christians are like this farmer. 
They go through their days barely hanging on to their spiritual lives, living in their own weak strengths while beneath the surface. The power of God is ready to break free in their lives. I don't think that we understand the power keg. I think that's the right word. The power source that we're sitting on. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have no idea the potential that he is instilling you with. I believe in scripture it says the power to move mountains, right? All things are possible in Christ. I can do all things through Christ. All of those things, I don't think that we grasp that. I don't think that we truly understand the power source that we have been sitting on as Christians. Derek, on February the 11th, there was something released in you that can change the world. Brother, just hang on tight. Just hold on because there's something inside of you now that could change everything. You know what? I love the fact that when we trust Christ as our Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter what our past is. It's gone. It's gone. Now, we have people that like to bring that back up. But like in our deacon study this morning, that's nothing but gossip. There's no place for that, especially in the body of Christ. This morning, I want to start a a new series. Kenny's already hit on it just a little bit. And by the way, I need to say this. Um, I haven't really told y'all the whole story on Kenny. Um, Some of you may know it, but Kenny and I have been serving together for over 20 years. And and I didn't want to skew anybody's opinion um, when the vote came up. And and so... um, (laughs) I, I tried to just to say very little about it. Tried not to build him up or anything. I just, I just turned it over to the uh, search committee. I turned it over to the personnel committee. I turned it over to the church and just said, God's will, you'll be done. And then the vote came. And there was a 100% vote. And then on the way out the door, my understanding that somebody even asked the question, are we voting to replace Pastor Chuck? know how to feel about that to be honest with you (laughs) so Kenny you better bring your guitar and your Bible every Sunday (laughs) I want to start a um, a new series out of the book of Acts and it's my favorite book I've I've enjoyed studying it Um, I remember a trip that Kenny and Janie and myself were on we were in Alaska very much like our mission trip that we'll be doing in 2025 But while we were there on that mission trip, uh, each night we gave, I think we had 20 plus people in our group, and every night we assigned a chapter of the book of Acts that we would go over every night. And the five, six days that we were there, we covered the whole book of Acts. Had a great time. I don't think we slept very much, but it was daylight all the time. You couldn't sleep. But um, but we're going to get into Acts. Now, I want us to see in the book of Acts there, the book of Acts actually describes a transition, three different transitions. Geographically... It talks about a transition from Jerusalem to Rome, all right? So that's the first transition we see. The second transition that we see is actually a theological transition from Israel to the church. So we go from the Old Testament to the birth of the church. And then racially is actually another transition from the Jews to the Gentiles. So Acts is a record of the power exercised in the midst of persecution. So there was, persecu- there was a lot of persecution that was happening, but the book of Acts works through that. It's an account of the life and health pouring in from a living Christ into a sick society through the channel of obscure men and women, very much like us today. So it's kind of neat because the the author of the book of Acts was Luke, the physician. So if you study the scriptures, you talk about the gospels. When you look at Luke, Luke was actually a doctor. He was a physician. And so this is his book. He begins with a reference to his already completed work of the life of Christ, which we know as the Gospel of Luke. He says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. He says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So obviously that we see that the Gospel of Luke was volume 1, and Acts is volume 2. So Acts is continued, or it continues the story of what Jesus began both to do and to teach. 
Therefore, this is so neat. The book of Acts is yet to be complete. You ever thought about that? We are part of that book that continues on and on where we get the sermon series to be continued. Because when Jesus died and he was raised and he ascended into heaven, many people will say that's the end of the story, but the truth is that is really just the beginning of the story. Because it's the beginning of our story, is it not? The book of Acts is an unfinished book. It has never ended, but it is still being written. We are part of that story. Luke picks up his account in Jerusalem with the closing hours of Jesus' earthly ministry. It is the period between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And so what I want to do this morning and what I want to focus on is this, is that Dr. Luke actually gives us five foundation principles when building a church. Now, obviously, you could say, well, Pastor Chuck, um, Grace Baptist has been here for a long time. Grace Baptist is good. It's got a good foundation. Well, the church continues to grow. New people walking in the door. Deshaun getting baptized last week. Derek getting baptized this morning. The church continues to grow, so the foundation continues to be built upon. And so Luke gives us five strong foundational principles on building the church. And the first one I want us to see this morning is this, is that the first foundational truth or the first foundational principle is the believer's message. And what was the believer's message? And that is basically Christ is risen. Jesus, period. I mean, we could really just stop there. How do you build a church? You build it on Jesus. That's where you start. That's where the focus has to be. And as long as whatever we do, whether it's in Sunday school or whether it's the worship team or whether it's the message or whether it's small group or whether it's out in the community, whether it's on a mission trip, no matter what it is, as long as Grace Baptist Church makes it a point and makes it their mission to put Christ first, then everything else will work itself out. You know, it's not just that in the church either. It's in our personal lives. If we put Jesus first in our personal lives, it helps everything else out, right? What about in your marriage? How many of us started our marriage on shaky ground and then something happened and that something happened to be Jesus? It changes everything, doesn't it? All right, here's a squirrel. I can't help this. Miss Margaret, you look so pretty back there. Did you know that Derek is from Cashers? I got to say that. There's two people in this church from Cashers. I just, I got to say that. All right, I'm sorry. That was a squirrel moment. But so the believer's message, Christ is risen, Acts 1 and 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I want us to see here the Greek word. Now, I didn't know this about Brad, but Brad was throwing all these Greek words out this morning. Does he have, like, uh, a history in, in studying Greek or anything like that? Man, I was impressed. I thought, go Brad. But uh, here, here's a Greek word. The Greek word for proof here is a word that includes the idea of being convincing. The King James, or the New King James, uses the word infallible. And so... Luke, from the very beginning, established that Christianity is a religion based on historical facts. You can prove it all. A lot of people have tried to prove it wrong, and something usually happens in their life, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but it is all based on historical facts. First and foremost is the fact of the miraculous resurrection, what we celebrated last week. That's where the foundation begins. The, on the resurrection. That's how we can celebrate. That's why last Sunday we can consider our, our Easter Sunday as our Super Bowl Sunday because that's the day that we celebrate being set free, that we have the opportunity to be with God again because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The resurrection would be demonstrated by many convincing proofs, and once proven, it was the proof of everything else that really matters. I want to share with you four different proofs, and these are good, so I think you have it in your notes there this morning. But I want us to see four categories of four different proofs that, that the resurrection proved, okay? So the first one is this. The first proof was that the disciples saw Jesus. They saw him. They saw him. He appeared to them during 40 days. In fact, Luke is the only writer of Scripture who tells us that Christ's post-resurrection ministry covered 40 days. 
And the word here is one from which we get our word. All right, I got to I got to look at this one. Ophthalmia. I did it right. Ophthalmia. And that word stands for the word I. What do you think about that? So for 40 days, they described their time with Jesus with the word that recognizes the word I, or literally the eyeball. So if it were, if we were to use the modern language, what Dr. Luke was saying is this, these disciples eyeballed Jesus for a 40-day period of time. I, I know this is kind of strange, but have you ever seen anybody do this? You, you know what I'm talking about? And what are you doing? You're eyeballing them. You're watching them. For 40 days, the disciples eyeballed and they watched Jesus. So that's a proof. They watched him. They watched everything he did, every movement, every miracle that he performed. They watched Jesus. And now, I, I could imagine uh, before that he died on the cross, there were times that they would just kind of take a break. We know that. It's in Scripture that they would fall asleep, right? They weren't 24-7 watching Jesus, but I would imagine for those 40 days, they couldn't keep their eyes off of him. Just constantly, constantly watching. They saw him again and again, not merely once, but many times during this period. Each time he looked exactly the same. Here are some times. He appeared to Mary in the garden. We see that in the book of John. The woman on the wayside, Matthew. The disciples on the Emmaus Road. We see that in Luke 24. Simon Peter in the late afternoon in Luke 24. The disciples in the upper room. They saw him there. We see that in John. And again to the disciples so that Thomas might see and believe. The seven on the, on the shore of Galilee. The, then to 500 gathered on the hillside. We see that in 1 Corinthians. He, he appeared, he appeared to, to James in 1 Corinthians. And then to the disciples on the Mount of Olives as he ascended in Acts chapter 1. Could you imagine what that would have been like? Just as Jesus is ascending into heaven and you're standing there. Somebody you've been eyeballing. Somebody you've been watching for 40 days. Somebody that you saw raised from the dead, and then you're just... It was kind of like Leon, I would imagine. When Coach Knight hit himself in the head with that, with that bar, that metal thing, and Leon just stood there with his mouth wide open like, what is wrong with him? But they just stood there. They saw him. But the second thing we see is that disciples not only saw him, but they heard him. They heard Jesus. It's one thing to see something, it's another thing to hear something or someone. In Acts 1-3, it says this, he presented himself alive speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So evidently, Jesus appeared at intervals, coming and going from heaven at will. I don't want you to miss that. He was coming and going at will, showing miraculous signs and instructing his disciples about the kingdom of God. You know, I, I don't think that we give this enough credit. Well, as a matter of fact, Leon took me to see uh, Miss Crawford when she was in hospice. And I was told while we were there that Miss Crawford had been doing a lot of studies on what her glorified body was going to be like. That lets me know several things. The first thing it lets me know is that she knows she's going to have one, right? Because she knows Jesus is Lord and Savior. But to have a glorified body, I don't think that we grasp exactly what that's going to be like. Jonathan, we're going to be able to walk through walls. Could you imagine? I mean, I don't think that there is an earthly vision that we could actually get what that's going to be like. But Jesus was appearing to them, so not only did they see him, but they heard him in that glorified state. The third thing we see is that the disciples touched him. They saw him, they heard him, and they touched him. In order to convince his followers of the reality of his resurrected body, Jesus allowed them to feel with their hands. The reality of his risen body was tried and proven by the normal means of sensory perception, and Jesus reappeared to the disciples with the sole purpose of allowing Thomas, allowing his doubts to be stilled. That's where we get doubting Thomas from. But the fourth thing is probably the most unique thing. The disciples fed Jesus. Not only did they see him, hear him, touch him, but they fed him. So think about this. This being the ultimate proof was that he ate with us. They saw the food disappear. So let's just say some of the skeptics would say that Jesus was just a ghost. 
Now, Jennifer, I, I think it was Jennifer that brought in the manna this morning, the Swiss roll cakes. And um, could you imagine Jesus eating a Swiss roll cake if he was a ghost? And then he walks away and the Swiss roll cake would just be on the ground, right? Or drink something and walk away and there would be a puddle of liquid. But that wasn't the case. It wasn't the case at all. The Bible says this, this is the proof. He ate with us, so we know he is alive. Peter declared in the home of Cornelius, him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. The end result of all of these appearances was that the apostles came to believe absolutely in the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. They believed like never before. As a matter of fact, we covered it last week. They were willing to die. They were all martyred for Christ because they knew that he was real. That assurance gave them the boldness to preach Christ to the very people who had crucified him. It is a belief in the reality of the resurrection that turned the apostles from being very, uh, to being fearful skeptics into bold, powerful witnesses. You remember I told you on February 11th, something came into you that is going to be more powerful than anything that you've ever imagined all your life, and that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was present in each one of these apostles. John the Apostle goes even beyond this, and he declares that the foundation of the faith and life in Jesus Christ is the historical evidence that Jesus was seen, heard, and was handled during those post-resurrection appearances. 1 John 1, 1 and 2 says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So throughout the centuries, many attempts have been made to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. There's, there's people even today, but this has happened for all, I wouldn't say all eternity, but since Jesus died on the cross, there have been people trying to disprove the resurrection, but none has ever been able to be successful. Time and time and time again, people try. They try to disprove. They try to say that this couldn't happen and this couldn't happen. There, there's no way that this can happen. But time and time again, when they study and when they look into it, when they dig into it, they end up finding themselves coming to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Example, have you ever seen or read the book, The Case for Christ? Lee Strobel was one of those um, newspaper writers. His, his wife... Um, got saved and, and she wanted to go to church and to to appease her he would go with her but his whole purpose was to go and to disprove her faith and in the end he came to know Christ as his Lord and Savior as well because he couldn't disprove the facts Jesus is a living Savior Muhammad died He's still dead. Buddha died and is still dead. Confucius died and is still dead. But when you go to the tomb of Jesus, we hear the glorious message, he is not here for he is risen. I know I can't speed up the book of Acts, but there's a part that I want to get to and I'm just going to touch on it for just a second. But Jesus showed himself to Saul on the road to Damascus, and it sent him out as a flaming evangelist. Probably the greatest missionary of all time. He also showed himself to a shoeman in Chicago named D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody went out to shake up the world for Christ. It was not you'll like this, but he also showed himself to a baseball player named Billy Sunday who went on to win millions for Christ. But he also showed himself to a high school baseball coach in 2002 on the side of a volcano. And he is still showing himself today. I think if you were here last Sunday, you saw a little glimpse of that, didn't you? But you know what I expect every time I walk in the door of Grace Baptist Church? 
I expect the Holy Spirit to show out just like I anticipate that. I look forward to that. What's God going to do next? Number two. I did a lot on number one, didn't I? Number two. The second foundation is the believer's might. And in that we see the power of the Holy Spirit. Might, mighty, the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 4, and 5 says this, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And Jesus had previously promised in John 14, 16, and 18, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and I will, and will be in you. Verse 18, And I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. That, that's a promise that God gives us. He's not going to leave us alone. He promises that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. He is always there. When we are in times where we feel like there is no one there, we can always know and count on that our Lord and Savior Jesus will be there. These verses are actually the fulfillment of that promise. The third thing I want you to see is this. The third foundation is that of the believer's mission. And what is the mission? What is the mission of the church? And it's the establishment of the kingdom. Acts 1, 6, and 7 says this. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And what I want you to see here is that the disciples were not at all clear about the nature of the kingdom. Um, they weren't sure exactly when Jesus was talking about his kingdom, what type of kingdom was he going to bring? And their idea of the Messiah was a soldier like Judas Maccabees. And, and when I uh, started looking that up and, and kind of the history of him, in and, and 164 B.C., um, Judas Maccabees, what he did was he went in and he removed all the Greek um, statues of the gods and goddesses out of the second temple. So he went in and he removed all of that. And so when they were thinking of a Messiah, they were looking for somebody that was strong, somebody that was a soldier that would go in and do the very same thing. Somebody that would um, occupy with military force. In those days, the land was actually occupied by the Romans. So the Jews were looking for a Messiah who would expel the Romans and set up the earthly kingdom of David. So that's what they were looking for. That's what they were expecting. And so when Jesus was, was talking about these things, they were confused all the time about what exactly is he saying? What kind of kingdom is he talking about? And when he would go into detail, they were just completely um, perplexed. They were confused about some of the things that he was saying. You know, it was actually this kind of expectation that gave rise to the occasion in which the mother of James and John approached Jesus asking, Grant unto these sons of mine that one may sit at your right hand and other may sit at your left hand in your kingdom. And really what is going on here is all they're doing is asking, Jesus, is it, is it now? Is this the time? Is this what we've been waiting on that you're finally going to restore your kingdom? And Jesus said to them, it is not your business to know when I'm going to establish my kingdom. It is your business, it is your job, it is your responsibility to be my witnesses. Not to understand all of this, but it is your responsibility to be my witnesses to the world. The fourth thing I want you to see this morning is this. The fourth foundation is the believer's mandate. Now, I really like this. The believer's mandate. And what is the mandate? What, what exactly does the word mandate mean? Mandate is a command. It is a responsibility. It is a job that has been given to each of us as Christ followers. And that mandate is this, is to go make disciples. God has given us a job to do. Jesus has given us a command. In Acts 1.8 it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And what we see here is that the Lord laid down in the clearest possible terms the mandate for those who are to follow him. 
And the mandate of the church that dares to call itself a New Testament church is necessary. It's absolutely necessary that we are on mission. What does that look like, Pastor Chuck, to be on mission? It looks like Thursday night is what it looks like. We're going to be on mission when we go to the assisted living home on Thursday night. It looks like the pizza, not the pizza kitchen. Oh, that'd be great. We need to do ministry at the pizza kitchen. It looks like the soup kitchen that we'll be at on a Saturday in just a couple of weeks. It looks like a mission trip to Alaska or to South America or to here in our very own community. That's what being on mission is all about. It means that we are willing to get up out of our seats, walk out those doors, and tell somebody the good news of Jesus. That's about being on mission. We cannot, should not keep it to ourselves. And if we're keeping it to ourselves, shame on us. Share the good news. Be on mission. Jesus told the disciples that they must wait upon the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And the word power here in Greek, it comes from the Greek word dunamis. And I didn't know this until I did the research here. But the Greek word dunamis entered the English language when the Swedish chemist and engineer Alfred Bernard Noble, you may know him from the Nobel Peace Prize, made the discovery that became his fortune. He discovered a power stronger than anything the world had known up to that time. And he asked a friend of his who was a Greek scholar what, that, what the word for explosive power was in Greek. And his friend answered dunamis. And Noble said, well, I'm going to call my new discovery by that name. So he called this explosive power dynamite. That's where we get the word dynamite from. And the disciples at this point, and what I want us to see this, is they, they were in this transitional period. And it was, it was the beginning of the church, and it was just the very beginning. So, but, but I want us to understand in our present age, the baptism of the Spirit or the infilling of the Spirit takes place for believers at the moment of salvation. There, there was a waiting time. And I know that this kind of gets confusing when you get into different theologies and different doctrines and stuff like that it gets kind of confusing but we need, need to understand this that on February the 11th or when I was 13 years old or whenever your day of salvation was we must understand that the day that we got saved we were filled with the Holy Spirit in that moment you were filled with everything that you need to accomplish whatever God calls you to do in your lifetime everything was given to you in that moment at the moment, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, every believer is placed into the body of Christ, and at that point, the Holy Spirit also takes up permanent residence. So there is no such thing as a Christian that does not yet have the Holy Spirit, even if somebody else says that. The Scripture says, at the moment of salvation, we are filled. But the earlier disciples had to wait for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We do not. It's available right now that's exciting y'all that's exciting how does how does Harold stand up here with that fancy instrument every Sunday and play his heart out or how does Gloria behind the keyboard stand with her hand raised and her hands on her key how does she do that or, or how does um, others stand in the, in the choir and sing they only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit I guarantee you that if Harold were to stand up here and say I do that in my own strength his days are numbered the power of the Holy Spirit is available to us now available to all believers yet the Holy Spirit and his power must be sought listen to me it requires consecration commitment to God we must desire it and work for it how many of us woke up this morning really seeking to be empowered by the Holy Spirit when you got out of bed you said Lord come on fill me up so that when I walk into that church or I walk into this gas station or I walk into this restaurant that people will look at me and see that there's something different because I am so filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's something that we have to seek, something that we have to ask for. But unfortunately, what happens is this, is that many Christians, not y'all, but many Christians think that if they just show up on Sunday morning that they've done God a favor. That's hard to hear. 
But it's so much more than that. Have you ever heard somebody say that, um, that they've never received the gift of evangelism? But truthfully, I want you to hear this. There's no such thing as the gift of evangelism. There's something called the gift of an evangelist. But the gift of evangelism, evangelism, to tell somebody about Jesus was given to every one of us when we trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He has called us to be his witness. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, and it is our responsibility. That's the only reason that he has left us here, y'all. We have a purpose, and it's not to keep the good news to ourselves. It's to share it with the whosoever. Gary, you got a, I'm a whosoever shared on today, and that is absolutely amazing. But every one of us is the whosoever. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But once we're saved, we've got a responsibility, and that's to tell somebody else. And then tell somebody else. And tell somebody else. I sure am glad that there was somebody that told me. There's a... Um, our English word witness comes from an old English word that we don't really use very often anymore. And it's the word wit. And to wit means to know. A wit is a knowledgeable person. So a witness is someone who knows something and testifies about it. Do you know anything about Jesus? Do you know what he did in your life? Early on, a couple of months ago, I asked each one of you to write down your testimony. Some of you did. That's your story. A wit, a witness, is somebody who tells their story to a lost and dying world in hopes that one day they too will have a story to tell a lost and dying world. The fifth thing I want you to see is this. The believer's motivation. And what is that motivation? Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that? Jesus is coming again. Acts 1, 9, 11 says this, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven will, so, will come again in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So what I want us to see is that. You remember earlier on I talked about, you know, what would it have been like standing there watching Jesus ascend into heaven. But then there were two angels that came and said, what are you doing? You've been given a job to do. You've been given a task. And so in that particular day, there was no room for idle standing around and so why would there be room for that today we got a job to do we got a job to do this becomes a compelling motivation in the life of a believer no one knows when he will come but everyone must live with the anticipation that he will come during their lifetime that's why we have to have a rapture pose right miss tina you got yours all right let's see it she's got it in a moment in a twinkling of an eye Listen to this. I'm going to close here. Think about this. God the Father has sent God the Holy Spirit to all the disciples of God the Son so that we can have all the power necessary to meet the challenges in our life. Trinity. It's time that we give the Holy Spirit control. But be ready. Get ready. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, something is going to happen. We need to be like a little girl listening to her grandmother reading stories from the Bible. And the grandmother asked her what she thought of it. And the little girl responded, Oh, I love it. You never know what God is going to do next. So when it, the Holy Spirit controls our lives, then listen to this. Discouraged folks, cheer up. 
Dishonest folks fess up. Sour folks sweeten up. Closed folks open up. Gossipers shut up. Conflicted folk make up. Sleeping folk wake up. Lukewarm folk fire up. Dry bones shake up. Pew potatoes stand up. And most of all, Christ the Savior will be lifted up. Grace Baptist Church, it's time for us to stand up. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that we have the opportunity, first of all, to know you as Lord and Savior, but then to be part of your plan to go to a lost and dying world to share the good news of Jesus. Lord, you have allowed us to be witnesses. So shame on us if we keep that good news to ourselves. Help us to be more committed than ever before. Lord, we have an opportunity to reach this community for you. We can change the world through this community and then beyond. So God, thank you for that opportunity. But more than that, Lord, I pray that you will deal with every heart that's in this room. Lord, we got guests. We have first-time visitors. We have people I really don't know. So Lord, I can't say that I know that every single person in this room knows you as Lord and Savior. I sure would like that. That's the desire of my heart. But God, if there's one here that has never enter into a personal relationship with you if they don't know where they're going to spend their eternity. Lord, we've asked that the Holy Spirit be present today and deal with every heart that's in this room. Lord, you may be doing that right now. You may be convicting someone right now. And Lord, I pray for that individual. For individuals Lord that that knocking that you're doing right now that they have the opportunity to be set free set free from their sin set free from a lifestyle set free from bondage set free from struggles and pain and difficulty and everything that the world throws out us God you died to set us free from our sin. So if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, can I tell you that you can be set free today? Well, Pastor Chuck, how do I do that? The Bible tells us that we're all sinners. Everybody in this room, we're just alike. And because of that sin, that sin separates us from a holy, just God. God tells us this, that the gift of God is salvation in Christ Jesus and that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God wants to save you right now. That's what I want, Pastor Chuck. I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Pray this with me. Dear Jesus, I get it. Today I'm not going to run from the Holy Spirit anymore. But I'm going to surrender my life. Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me. Save me from my sins. Help me to turn from my sins and to live my life for you. Come into my heart, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. In a moment, we're going to have something called an invitation. We'll be standing up front. If you prayed with me or if you've asked Christ to save you and you've never made that public, this is your opportunity tell the world that I identify with Christ if you've done that and you've never been baptized you'd like to do that you don't have to do it today but we can if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you let's get that set up taken care of today maybe if you're looking for a church home we talked about this is the body of Christ you make up the body and we need you 
We need you to reach the world for Jesus. So if you know that this is where you need to be, we invite you to make this your church home today. Maybe just want to pray. I know that some of you in this room have a lot. I can't think of a better place to bring that burden to. Lord, thank you for the time that you've given us. Thank you for being Lord of my life. And Lord, for being available to the whosoever. Lord, I pray now as we enter our time of invitation, if there's one that's trusted you as Lord and Savior, that they would make that known today. But Lord, I also pray that you would just move as you see fit. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll stand to your feet, I'll be available. Why don't you seat for just a second i'm going to bring up is it millie all right millie <laughs> keysacker Woo, glory all right so this is uh, millie keysacker and uh, she has been here uh, i think three four sundays now 
four Sundays. And uh, first time I met her, um, she was sitting over here, and we had a great conversation after the service. But this is um, your mother-in-law, right? All right. So, um, so we are uh, so grateful that she's here. She came forward, wants to rededicate her life to Christ. We prayed for that, prayed about that. And uh, she says, amen. Um, she says she knows Jesus as her Lord and Savior, but she feels like this is home. And so she wants to move her membership uh, from Return Baptist Church. They're going to be mad at me. Uh, but uh, to here to grace. And so church family, all in favor of that? Amen. 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 All right. And certainly I'm not even going to talk to those opposed. So. Uh, but anyway, we are so glad that you're here. God's got huge plans for you, and uh, you are part of this body, just like everybody else is. So these are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so uh, that means that we're going to lock arms and come alongside and, uh, and do ministry with you, do serve with you. So we're so grateful you're here. In just a moment, I'm going to let you stand up here and let people come out and shake your hands. But uh, I'll let you sit right there for just a second. Um, Chris and Marlene. You know these folks, and um, all right, Chris and Marlene, they uh, have a, a pretty important appointment on Tuesday. So y'all be praying for that. It's a 3 o'clock appointment. Um, you know, my God is a miracle worker, right? And so uh, just keep praying, praying hard. Even uh, through that uh, meeting, they'll get, their, um, they'll get the results from the uh, biopsy that he had. And, um, but he... He was so encouraging this morning at the deacons meeting and said they'll be putting together a game plan. And so whatever that game plan is, he's ready to, uh, to face that head on. Uh, Marlene has been a rock for him. I'm so proud of her. And um, so y'all just continue to pray for him, love on them. And I know that you have been, but, uh, but we just know that uh, we're just putting you in the Lord's hands, right? No, yes, better, no greater hands to be in. So I tell you what, I'm just going to pray over you guys. Anybody would like to come up and pray? Uh, we'll close our service uh, with that. Y'all come on. Lord, we just, um, we just come to you as, as a family, as the body of Christ. And uh, Lord, right now, we just, uh, we just thank you for the service that you gave us today. We, we thank you for uh, our newest um, Millie that has come to be a part of our family. Um, Lord, but we think about the, uh, the, the meetings that are coming up this week. Lord, I think about Justin and the important meeting he's got on Tuesday. Lord, I pray that you'll be with him and his family. And Lord, that they're able to get those answers and, and get things set up and, and uh, moving in the right direction there. Uh, but Lord, right now we pray especially for Chris and Marlene. And, and Lord, I, I know that um, there's a meeting that's on the schedule. But Lord, I know that you are working. Uh, and Lord, we just ask you to work overtime. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, uh, work a miracle, perform miracles. And, Lord, that uh, the, the news that they hear is um, better than they could ever imagine. And uh, so, Lord, we just trust uh, that you would do that. We believe that you would do that. And we give you the glory in advance for just doing that. And uh, so, Lord, help us to be standing here next Sunday morning uh, with our hands up high, shouting, look what my Jesus did. And, uh, Father, we just ask you to go with us now as we go into the mission field and uh, to be your witnesses um, to those that you put before us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. You're dismissed. Oh, y'all don't forget about Millie. Come on, Millie. <laughs> All right. We just had her up here. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. So send me the address. <laughs>